Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. We've been, uh, we've been mining the, uh, the deep recesses about this subject of presence and uh, trying to address some things the last few services. And I uh, want to continue on that theme today. And uh, uh, that uh, the offering, the offertory worship was so appropriate about what uh, uh, just goes right hand in hand with what we want to speak about this morning. And uh, we're again, we're just glad you're here. You know, as we begin to realize that prayer is less about something we do and more about someone we are. If we uh, you know, and who God is. That presence, that abiding, that that fellowship, that communion. It, it's more about the presence of someone uh, than it is a shopping list. The, the presence of the Lord. Uh, you know, we've already, uh, uh, if you've heard the last few messages on this subject, you know that, uh, you know, uh, we remain in him. We linger in his presence. We let him love on us and father us. And in return, his word remains in us. So, so when situations come along, it's, oh, 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 what's the word say? What does the word say? Yeah, we're all subject to the flesh and it's weak and it gets tired and, and anger and all that, that, that yucky stuff that's attributed to the fallen nature. It's not of God. Uh, but so, so we need to learn to linger in his presence. That Then we can pray and be confident of the answer because we've heard him speak into the matter. Whatever that, whatever that issue is. And we can be assured that he will answer. Amen? He will answer. And almost from the moment I've said this, here's what a lot of you are asking. Because I know, because I are one of you. How? How? How do you do that? What's, what's the formula? What's the laundry list? How, how do I do this? I, uh, you know, what's A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, X, Y, Z? How do I do this thing? It seems almost impossible in our culture for, for us in this, in this run, 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 run atmosphere, this, this, this uh, the, the race of the rodent. <laughs> See, I cleaned it up. I didn't call it a rat race. You know, we, we, we think... Uh, uh, how do we embrace God all day, every day? How do we do that? I have to admit, I have to confess to you, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. But how do I embrace God all day, every day? You see, I've been made for him. You have too. You're not made for you. You're not made for yours. Matter of fact, I mean, the truth be told, the only thing you have really is the gift of life that that's in you right now. Everything else is, you know, people die. People get sick, people graduate, people get married, people move away, right? What kind of control do you really have other than right here? Decisions that you and I make. Really? So how I want to experience his presence all day, every day. But we're so geared to doing, we need someone to always tell us what to do how to do. And Isaiah 30 describes this for us. It describes us, even though it was written to Israel a long time ago. I mean, it, it's us right here in 21st century USA. The children of Israel, they were obstinate. They refused to trust God. They made alliances with Egypt for protection. 
They're looking to man for the answers. They're looking for solutions among fallen men, and they refuse to deal with things and look to the only real place where there is a solution. I mean, Israel was living in an unfriendly environment filled with deadly animals and threats to their safety. And they had refused to hear the preachers that God had sent along. He, they refused to hear the, the warnings and, and the encouragement. Matter of fact, back in verse 10 of this chapter, they said, listen, don't tell us what God says. Tell us what we want to hear. Tell us what will make us feel good and encourage us. And don't you dare, don't you dare tell us about our sin. Sound familiar? Isn't that what the world wants today? How dare you stand for holiness and righteousness? You're so narrow. You're so intolerant. Well, if, that, if that's narrow and intolerant, then God is. But doesn't the Bible say narrows the path that leads to him and broad is the, the road that leads to destruction? Sometimes we confuse the love of God for a license to sin. And they don't go together. Repentance and faith are inseparable. And if you have one without the other, you're headed for trouble every time. Every time. Well, Israel said to the, the preachers God sent to them, Stop confronting us. Stop telling us what. Listen, God says then, if you don't listen, if you don't listen, then judgment will come, and it is coming, isn't it? I mean, now, come on. Have you been awake the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years? I mean, however long you've been here. Judgment, judgment, judgment. I thank God for our military. But I'm telling you, our military can't save us for what, from what we're facing. Because our military can't stand against God Almighty. God said to the children of Israel, he says, listen, you're going to have to learn this or you're going to face, you, you're going to endure the punishment brought on by your attitude and your actions. Oh, God, help us. To realize the seriousness of sin unconfessed. The seriousness of, of, of hidden sin. The seriousness of redefined sin. Because the only person we're fooling is ourselves. We're not fooling God. I know I haven't read the scripture yet. But I, I've done it on purpose. We're going to get there. Then we see in verse 15 a direct quote from God, and this is the way out. Here we go. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. You shall be delivered. You shall be rescued. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, but you would not. In this one verse, he gives them four keys to unlock the presence and blessing of God. I want to know them, don't you? I want to understand them. I want to make them real in my life. Because I tell you, living, living on choppy water all the time, living in gale force wind all the time, is no fun. If you're with God, it's all right, but it's still not a whole lot of fun. We can learn from these four as we practice the presence of God. Say practice. First thing we see right here in this verse, <clears throat> he says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. Now, there's no doubt who's talking here. It's the Creator God Almighty Himself, Yahweh, 
the one who brought them out of Egypt, the one who called Abraham, who, who set it all up, it is the one only true and living God who's been revealed to fallen mankind through his son, his only begotten son, Jesus. He says, in returning. Now, this word's unused. I, I think in the old King James it might say repent or repentance. I'm not sure. Anyone got an old one? Okay. This is the only place in the Old Testament this Hebrew word is used. Now, when you and I think of repentance, we usually think a change of mind that results in a change of direction. That's the New Testament. Well, that's the Old Testament for the most part, the understanding of it. But that's not what this word means. This word, it, uh, hmm, how do I say that? You see, I took Greek, but Hebrew took me. Sh However you put S-H-U-W, shuba. That's the Hebrew word, shuba. <laughs> and you know what it means? It doesn't mean change of mind that results in a change of action. It, it has the idea of retirement and withdrawal. That's, that's, that's a different perspective. To retire and to withdraw. He says here, in returning, in re retiring and withdrawing. You see, if you're going to hear from God to really practice his presence, you're going to have to retire from what you're doing. That keeps you from his presence. Whatever that is. Now, I can't tell, you know, I can, I can make a laundry list 400 pages long and miss you completely. But the Holy Spirit will hit the nail on the head every time. And the Holy Spirit is hitting it, the, that nail on the head for you in your life right now as you ponder this and you think about this. What must I retire from and withdraw away? You see... God said to the children of Israel, how's it working for you? <laughs> You're getting ready to be overrun. You're scared. And you're going to Egypt for protection. Instead of coming to me. How's that working for you? Well, if you know anything about history, it didn't work very good, did it? And that's what he's saying to us. You see, we've relegated prayer to a thing we do at an appointed time. I'm guilty. I mean, my goodness, I can remember. You know, when I got my, my heart right with the Lord, rededicated my life to the Lord as a young man and, and started going to church faithfully and reading my Bible and I'd hear preachers preach and I'd hear teachers teach and I'd hear these things and I'd well... You know, and I, I read where John, John Wesley, he'd get up four hours before daylight because he had to pray four hours. And they said, what do you do that for? He says, because I can't get done today what I need to get done if I don't spend four hours in prayer. <laughs> oh, man, guilt. Guilt and condemnation. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. I, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm the kind of sanguiney fellow I am. Man, 10, 12, 15 minutes is an eternity and he, four hours, four hours, no wonder he never lived with his wife. Oh, that's the truth. John Wesley and his wife never lived together. They, oh, it was terrible. That's a whole other story. Give you something to research now, won't it? Great man of God and, uh, well, never mind. God bless John Wesley. Well, friends, you see, the Lord says, retire, quit doing what you're doing. If we always do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always gotten. When are we going to learn that? No. When am I going to learn that? When am I going to figure that out? 
Well, you know it's true for you, but I'm just picking on me. When am I going to learn that? When you continue to do what you've always done, you're always going to get what you've always gotten. I hope that's grammatically correct. I really worked hard on it, Kathy. Ain't that right, honey? Oh. <clears throat> you see, insanity, as Albert Einstein said, uh, and he came up with this, but apparently he's a little insane because in some things he always done. Well, never mind. You always get, you know, always doing the same thing, expecting a different result. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. It does not happen. If you're ever going to embrace and practice the presence of God in your life, you must re, we've got to withdraw from a faster paced way of living. You've got to ask the Lord, Lord, tell me what, what brings glory to you. Now, listen, God understands you've got to make a living. You're entitled to nothing but the opportunity to make a living. And he'll give it to you if you want to work. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that. I mean, I know, I, I just don't, I can't. God has always been there for me when I needed something. When I need to, you know, if I needed to, a job, I, I found one because I looked for one. I prayed for one and I looked for one. Some people say, oh, I just pray and wait. Well, put some legs on your prayers. My goodness gracious. I mean, yeah, God's God, but he expects you to cooperate with him. I don't know who that's for, but that was free. <clears throat> if your work and your entertainment occupies every thought... If your, if your business endeavors, if your, if your vocation, if your, you know, if it, it occupies, if that's what you live and that's what you breathe and that's what you do, you know, if it occupies, if it so consumes you, you don't have time for God. Now, God gave you the job, but it's God's job. And when we get so wrapped up in stuff, and let me tell you something, preachers do this all the time. We get so busy in doing the ministry, we forget to get along with God and experience God all day, every day. You know, it's like, well, I've got to put God on. Well, how are you? We're so glad you visited, and, and yeah, and you know, huh, and y'all come. Well, what's going on in the world today? What's Fox News say? What's CNN say? Now, oh, wait a minute. Put her on. Oh, we're sorry you're sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, those three-pack cigarettes, they might have something to do with it. Help us, Jesus. We we've got to we got to be we got to be who we are all the time. Somebody needs to say amen. We need to be who we need to be who we are all the time. You see, if your work, your entertainment occupies every thought, it's really hard to abide in Him. Well, I gotta. I got to do this and I got to do that and I'm going to experience that and I'm going to enjoy that and I'm going to this and I'm going to that and I'm this and that and that and that and this and this and where's God? Where is the Lord? We've got to practice his presence. People say it all the time. I can't hear from God. Heaven is brass. It, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Well, if you're not praying in his will because you've added prayer and, pre and presence to an already overfilled schedule, don't you figure God can under figure it out? Don't you realize God can figure out where he is on your priority list? I think he can. I think he's smart enough. The problem is we're not smart enough to figure that out. Where is he? Where is he? Second point. Okay, repentance. Say repentance. To withdraw from, to retire. To redraw, withdraw and retire. 
Now, you know, we're going to get a bunch of guys together here for too long. We're going to go walk down and watch the Nationals play. We, do we do it every week? No. Would I like to? Yes. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. My goodness. I mean, we, we went out Sunday afternoon. We went out to Zanesville, Ohio to see my grandson play baseball. Well, it's about time. This is his second year. And he says, Grandpa, have you ever watched me play baseball? Next week. <laughs> now, the fact that it was baseball is just added. Do you understand? It's that grandson God entrusted to me. It's it. You see? I want him to know that Grandpa loves him whether he strikes out or goes four, before, four for, for four like he did. <laughs> Chip off the old block, off the old block. Do you understand? You say, my goodness, preacher, it's five hours out there. You went out on Sunday and come back on Tuesday? Yeah. Well, that's awful far for such a little time. Yeah, it probably is. But you see... I want, someday I'm not going to be here, and I want Noah to think, and I want Madeline and Ava to think, Grandpa really loved me. And Grandma, too. Come all this way just to watch us play ball. Well, that's too far to go. You ought to stay a week. Well, ought to, could have, should have, would have, but didn't. Do you understand? We've got to withdraw and retire from a lot of things that just keep us, oh, I don't have time to go to church, don't have time to read my Bible, don't have time to share my faith, I don't have time for mission trips, I don't have time for the things of God, I'm too busy doing, making, being, earning, grabbing, growling, and who does that represent well? Amen? Okay. Second thing here. Second point. Whew. Time's flying. We're having fun, in it? He says, and rest. <sighs> rest. Next word gets r even more practical. You know, uh, he says we have to Rest. We have to rest. Now, some, somebody like me, that's one of the hardest things in the world to do because of how I'm wired. I mean, I didn't realize it. The other day, my son, we were going, we were driving. Luke was in the back, and, and he says, Daddy, why do you do that with your fingers? And I didn't even know I was doing anything with my fingers. And I paid attention, and I realized I was clicking my fingers on the gear shift. And I thought I was really being calm and quiet. And I said, well, son, I don't know. He says, well, Daddy, it's really annoying. <laughs> Rest. I don't even know how he knows what annoying is. Unless he heard someone else say it. <clears throat> but two verses come to mind when I think of rest. And it's in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, the place where we can get rest, the place where we can find solace, the place where we can be refreshed, the place where we can have greater purpose and understanding, the place where we can get everything that we really need is the place we try to avoid. And that's with him in his presence. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm just realizing how 
unlearned I am. See, we're, we're, uh, I heard someone say it a long time ago, right here in this pulpit. We're not, uh, it might have been Leif Headline, I'm not sure. We're not human doings, we're human beings. Mm. And so, weary? Most people I meet are weary. Burdened, you know, whether it's marital, relational of some sort, be it, you know, sibling or, or uh, uh, offspring or employment, weary, burdened, tired, overwhelmed. Oh, my goodness. And that's the typical believer. How, oh Lord, I need you a whole lot more than I even realized. Learn from him, he said. In me you'll find rest. And we've regulated abiding in him, talking with him to a desperate attempt to change our circumstances. Oh Lord. This is what it is, and oh, I can't handle it, and help me here. When the real answer is probably all that stuff's accumulating to drive us to him. And he'll walk us through it all. And he'll see us through it all. And he'll help us and bless us. And, and this word rest has the ad- attitude of, a, you know, a qu- to be able to quietly be at ease. Hmm. Seems to indicate that you cannot stay as busy as you are and keep trying to fix everything yourself and also hear his plan for the matter also. Mm. speaks volume, volumes about busyness. It, it, you have to say no to some good things in order to do the best things. Practicing his presence. You have to limit the noise, and even the noise that you do allow in your life has to be turned down from time to time. Here's one thing I've noticed in many homes today. You walk into a home, the TV is always blaring. Why is that? I mean, there's so many people today who can't even go to sleep without the TV on. What does that say? You know? I mean, they even, even, even on remotes, they got this thing called the sleep button. Well, I'm on, a, I'm on a 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120 minutes. You, you know I, I know all about that. How did we get here? That we're so busy and so cluttered and so afraid to be alone with ourselves and with God. We've got to have all the clutter and all the racket and all the noise. And then we wonder why Sissy and Bubby are acting the way they're acting. We wonder why the, the, the neighbor, you just can't get along with the neighbor. Worth a, I mean, my goodness, you're just praying, Lord, move them or burn their house down, do something. Just don't kill them. Why is that? And I don't have any neighbors in mind. help me Jesus you see this word is designed to force us to do something now you think about you know that uh, who come up with a recliner was that a lazy boy invention probably they're the best known to recline 
you know, legs come up, the thing goes back in his presence. To rest in his presence. And for, for years, I used to think, oh, boy, when you get in the presence of God, you just got to pray to you that be, great beads of sweat come down your face. And, and you got to squall to your lungs, hang out your nostrils. And you just got to jump and look like you're having a, a, an aerobic epileptic seizure of some sort, you know. You know it's true. Instead of rest and recline in his presence. You know, a new term. You know what this is called in a modern day term? Soaking. Soaking. You know? You say, I pray to you, I just don't like to lay down on the floor in the church. Well, then lay down somewhere else. Get you some good music that will glorify God and, and to where the drums don't sound like they're going to beat right out of the speaker. I mean, some music that's soothing and don't misunderstand me, drummers. I, God bless drummers now. But I mean, some music that will just soothe and relax and you can hear and listen and rest. Practicing his presence. Perhaps you're like me and you find yourself so busy that you have time, uh, you, you just have a hard time to hearing from God. Uh, to, to, I mean, to take time to focus on Him and to, and to take everything out and, and, to, and to blot it all out. And, and, and you'll find that as you wait on Him and you continue to, you operate, even though you're driving down the highway, you, 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 you acknowledge that, you know, God is here. He lives in me. He's here. He's right here. And, 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 and he loves me, and he wants to bless me, and he wants to empower me. And, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I, my attitude toward you has been so offensive, and I've been so unlearned and so unskilled in the Word that I didn't even realize it, that I, 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 I was so offensive in my busyness. And I apologize. Forgive me, Lord. You're here. I could never understand why grandma could be in the, in the, she had a hand pump in her sink, a hand pump. She, she took the water over to her gas stove to heat the water to do the dishes. And she'd be there cleaning the dishes and she'd be singing and all of a sudden I'd see tears running down her face. And I thought, boy, is the water that hot? You know, I'm just a little tow head. What, what's going on? She knew how to practice the presence of God. A woman born in 1890 who completed the third grade. And she understood a whole lot more than a lot of doctors I studied under in seminary. Practicing the presence of God. To be able to rest. Even in doing your daily stuff. It could be a. God help us to learn this again. You have to decide that hearing from God about a situation is paramount. And learning to rest in him is part of the solution. You see, repentance and rest will lead to to deliverance. To, the, the word here is, sal, is saved, but it, it has the idea uh, not of redemption, but resolution. Deliverance. Rescue. Resolved. Oh, now I see. Oh, man. Oh, this is, oh, yeah. The light of God shines on it. You say, oh, wow, yes. That'll work. Bless his holy name. I mean, uh, I'm discussing with a, some sisters about a mission trip and how to get some stuff there. And, and I can see the simplicity of it, but I've been down that road a lot of times. And, and this is their first rodeo, and they, this was, it was trying to overcome them, you know? But realizing that, well, now look here. 
Here's the answer to this. This is the answer to this. This is what we'll do here. And this is, it's, it's not a mountain. It's just a little bump. Because God's bigger than any mountain. And that's what he wants to shine down in us. About whatever it is where you are. In your walk. Oh, here comes another one. Well, I tell you, I, when I first come across this, I thought, man, I wish this verse wasn't in this Bible. <laughs> Point number three. In quietness. You see, this speaks of an attitude of the soul. Your intellect, your emotion, your will. <laughs> man, this is another toughie for me. In quietness. You see, a willful and knowledgeable commitment to be quiet in the face of adversity. You might as well give me a knife because I'm going to have to cut my tongue out. I'm going to have to gnaw it till it's uh, sore. I can't, you know, or put some duct tape, good old duct tape. <laughs> to refuse to fix it. Oh. But to rest quietly in the presence of the Lord to hear his perspective on the circumstance. Where have I been for 59 years? Where have you been for however many years you're on the earth? <laughs> and in Psalm 23, verse 8, this, this verse just will come alive for you. Listen to what it says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Let that sink in. There's a feast to be found when you quit flailing and just let him speak to you. This quietness, this to be quiet, to be tranquil, to be at peace, to be quiet, to rest, to lie still, to be undisturbed. Now, I've never had a sleep study done on me, but I have an idea. I'm a right active sleeper. I don't know. Because when I go to sleep, I'm asleep. I mean, give me 15 seconds, 30 at the most, I'm gone. Just, I mean, it's like throwing a switch. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Luke's the same way. I mean, he can be, Daddy, da 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 da. Well, wait a minute, son. And then I go back and he's asleep. I mean, that quick? Uh, that's a blessing, I'm, I'm sure. It is. It's a blessing. <laughs> Had an old preacher friend. And I, I better understand what he's saying. You know, I, I would visit him, and he was a mentor for me early in my life. And I'd go and, uh, and uh, knock on his office door and just see how he's doing. And, and uh, he was helping me along. And he'd say, well, come on in, Brother Bobby, and lay down. In an office? Come on in and just lay down. What was he? What, what did he mean by that? Well, I'll tell you. He's saying, you're going to have to learn to rest. You're going to have to learn to rest. Because the path is too long for you to run all the time, all the way. Rest. You know why people quit? They don't learn to rest. Had another preacher friend, uh, Dr. Jack Mays. He's a man I've not seen him in, my goodness, forever. I guess he's still alive. <laughs> and he would say, rest if you have to, but don't quit. Resting is so important. Got to learn to rest in him. And that's what this verse is saying. No matter how rough things are, just come in and lay down. 
probably lie down is the grammatically correct thing to say, but I'm covering my basis. Resting in his presence is more important than what you're doing. To rest in his presence because he is the solver. He is the answerer. He is the solution. Now, the fourth thing here, look here. It says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved, delivered, rescued. A resolution will come in quietness and confidence. Uh, the old King James, I think, says trust. Does it say trust? In quietness and confidence. The idea here is, uh, the, the word is bitka, B-I-T-K-A-H, if you spell it in English. Uh, it, it speaks of re- reliant, reliance, trust, trusting, a, a confident assurance and reliance upon. And, and who can that be other than God. You know, on your best days, on our best days, you know, we don't measure up perfectly. Some days we do better than others, but he always does. Never let you down, never fail you, never, never misunderstand you, never misquote you. <laughs> He's right there. And it's amazing. This word's only used one time in the Old Testament. This word for, for confidence or trust. It is really part of, of a compound thought that translates like this. You can be at peace in the Lord because you can trust the Lord. That's what bitka means. You can, be, you can be at peace in the Lord because you can trust the Lord. You see, we choose not to be at peace. Well, I got my rights. I, I, I got to defend myself. No, 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 that's God's job. That's God's job. He'll defend you. He'll take care of you. He'll provide for you. He will bless you. He will use you. He's your daddy. Trust him. You see, God is trustworthy. But you see, because you think, well, I got to do more. I got to do more. I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta do that. I, I've gotta, I've gotta, I've gotta. You know what you're saying? You're saying God's not trustworthy. You can trust yourself better more than you can God. That's a dangerous place. That's a foolish place. How confident, confident are you of God's ability to rescue and restore? He'll rescue you. He'll restore you. He will. Your lack of confidence in your prayer life says more about God than it does about you. Oh, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. I think we need to pray that prayer, don't you? Quietness and trust produces strength. Not your strength, but his. And then here comes the indictment to the children of Israel. But you would not. Mm. You see, you're not willing. That's what the, the prophet is saying to the children of Israel right here in the, in the context. Essentially, we've chosen busyness. We've filled our lives with noise and entertainment and worthy worry rather than practicing the presence of God. My goodness. Do you realize that there's... Uh, per capita, more people on medication today in America than any nation on earth. Do you realize that, I mean, we've got, you know, trying, you know, oh, I got to have this and that and this and that and this and that. I mean, we are far scores of percent higher than any other nation. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know that there are real medical conditions about imbalances and things like that. I understand that. Trust me, I've been involved with the different things like that. But, I mean, just, I'm not talking about the medical condition. I'm talking about our spiritual condition. I'm talking about who are we going to rely on in our daily walk. 
And there's far too many of us who are not trusting the Lord. God help us. We have more prescription drug addicts in America than any nation on earth. Why is that? Who are we trusting? Who are we trusting? And now, I mean, we're getting so crazy, there's states legalizing illegal drugs. You know? I mean, you know, uh, what, what town was it where this big crane fell down and, and they were tearing down a, and, it just, and six people were killed and they found out that the crane operator was high on pot? Well, sure, I can do that. I don't want him high on pot no more than I want him to have four or five beers in him either. Or two, for that matter. You see, we, we've chosen busyness. We filled our lives with noise and entertainment and worry. And then we get anxious and we get fretful and we get overwhelmed by our circumstances. And we just, oh, my goodness. And then we start looking for people, two people for answers. Well, my, my daddy will help me. My mother will help me. My father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my, 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 my employer, my, 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 my spouse, my, oh, I got to find, I got to find help here. I got to do this. I got to, oh, what am I, oh, we got to solve this problem. And God says, just be still, bring it to me, learn to rest in me. Be quiet, be quiet and rest in me and practice my presence. I'm here. I'm bigger than anything that you've ever faced or ever could face. I'm here. Trust me. Talk to me. Tell me about it. You don't have to call, text, email, and, and squall all over the country or all around the world. Take it to him. Take it to him first. There might be times you need to enlist people that you know that pray. Nothing wrong with that. We're told to pray for one another. But friend, you don't have the solution, but you have the, the solver. Mm -mm -mm. Now this word here, but you would not, it, it's pretty neat how, uh, how sometimes, do you know that there's a third language in the Bible? You know, Koine Greek in the New Testament and Hebrew in the Old Testament. But there's also some Aramaic. And do you realize that Aramaic was the tongue that Jesus' mother spoke to him? You know, when Jesus, Eloi, Eloi, Labakthem, that was Aramaic. That wasn't Hebrew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was Aramaic. It wasn't Hebrew. It definitely wasn't Greek. <laughs> and this right here is from an Aramaic root. But you would not. And it has this idea. Now, God says, rest, recline, retire, withdraw, quiet, trust. Talk to me. Get alone with me. And the scripture says, but you would not. In the Aramaic, the root there, it means that you would not because you loathe it. Do we so despise the presence of God? Do, are we so offended by his greatness, his holiness, his love, his perfection, Grace and mercy abound. Why would we loathe him, the one who loves us the most? Oh, my. My prayerlessness speaks to him that not only do I not love him as I should, but that I actually loathe him. Him. Oh God, I had to fall to my knees and repent. I have to get down on my face and say, Oh God, I've been so blind. I've been so foolish that I thought I was somebody. I knew something. 
when, Lord, I'm just a worm, but you've shown your love and made me your child. Oh, God, help me to keep my perspective right. That you are the great I am. And I'm just a little speck on the back of a flea that you have rescued and made me your son. Whew. Puts a whole different perspective on it, doesn't it? How do we practice his presence? Let's love him, don't loathe him. Let's stop being so full of ourselves and who we, you know, oh, I've got my reputation. I've got my, I've got my opportunity. I've got my, thank God for it all. But whatever it is, it came from him. Spend time with him. That's the bitter irony. The very thing that we give, that would give us strength for the journey and deliverance in the circumstances that we all face, the presence of God is something so foreign and undesirable that we fail to usually try it. Oh, God, help me. Help me to make more time for you and less time for me. Let's land this plane, shall we? Will you do just what he says in this one simple verse? Will you do what he says? Will you abide in him? Will you rest and trust? Rest in him and trust him. Or will we continue to flail aimlessly and live a life of high blood pressure and anxiety and sleeplessness? You see, each time you feel anxiety ramping up, and everybody, everybody, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Stop and ask God to speak into the situation and to show you what he's saying to you through it. Don't see it as, oh, this is wrong and this is the devil. Well, I, you know, don't give him any more credit than he deserves. Just say, okay, God, I see this. I recognize it. I'm aware of it. Now, what do you want me to learn from it? Because I know you're over everything. What am I to learn from this? Instead of spending every moment with the radio or television on or the, the, inter, the computer, can we consider a commitment to deliberate quiet, or quietness probably is the better word to say. Dare we turn everything off? You say, I, I don't, Pastor, I don't like who I am. That's why I don't want to be alone with me. Well, you like who he is, don't you? Yeah, then you're not alone. And he will show you things and speak to you about things and bring you along in things and teach you things that you don't know and you desperately need. Ask God to talk to you throughout your day. I mean, you know that word, that 1 Thessalonians, what is it, 522, pray without ceasing? Technically, that's the shortest verse in the Bible, but not in English, but in, in Greek it is. Pray without ceasing. How do I do that? Consciously aware that he's with me all the time. He's there. He's there just like the air, the water, the earth. He's there. And he loves you so much. And he wants to be such a tremendous blessing. He wants to be a supplier. He wants to be a need meter. He wants to, to be all those things that we're, we need, we have to have, we don't, and we're anxious about it, and we're flailing about it, and we don't know what to do. And he says, yes, you do. Come to me. Oh, I've made a mess of this. Well, he knows we're messy. But 
come to him. Come to him. And he'll make the difference. Ask him to reveal where he's working when you feel overwhelmed. You ever felt overwhelmed lately? Okay, God. You have my attention. I'm listening. I'm retiring. I'm withdrawing. I've called my dogs in. We're not even in this hunt. Unloaded my gun. Put it on. Put it away. I'm listening. I'm relaxing. I'm resting. You see, that's where you will hear God. That's what he means when that the whirlwind, the flood, the lightning, the thunder, or the still, small voice. He's got things to tell you that's just between you and him. You know, the secrets. Shh, don't tell anybody. Just for you. That's why he loves us so much. But we don't realize as much as he wants us to realize his great love wherewith he loved us. It'll make the cross even more tender to your heart. It'll make the name of Jesus. It's hard to say it without tears coming to your eyes. When they talk about the blood, you just want to park your mule somewhere and have a hoe down. You understand? But you've got to have that alone time with him. Spend more time with him and less time with yourself. You see what, you know what the TV and the radio and, and the computer and, and whatever else there is, you know, all this, all this racket and noise and fuss and muss and The only one that you can really hear is you. See, that's how we get alone with ourselves. With a lot of busyness, fuss and muss and racket and noise and running to and fro and doing this and that and going here and it's just filling our schedule so full of activity. The only one we can really hear is us. But you got to take that stuff away to really, really, really hear him. Have you ever noticed that you can't really read your Bible and focus and concentrate and really get? I can't if there's a lot of racket. Just can't. I got to get up for everybody else. Because I know I can't stay up after longer than everybody else. Well, buddy, come 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, might as well be 2 in the morning for me. I mean, I got to go to sleepy town. I don't care if the mime is talking. Dear friends, let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, Teach us how to better practice your presence. And I pray, Lord, that every believer here will make a conscious decision before you and to speak to you, be they standing on their feet or sitting in their pew or their seat or kneeling somewhere. Help us, Lord. Forgive us. 
for many, Lord, this is, this is a sin of, of omission. We, we were ignorant, unlearned about these things. Oh, God. And I pray if there are people here who do not know you as Lord and Savior, they've not been born again, they've not passed from death unto life, they might be religious, but they've not been saved. Help them to come and meet me here at the front, and we'll, we'll introduce them to Jesus.